You finally landed at Hardening Greylog, where we will help you encryptify your log supply. Uh, the real subtitle uh, is why you should use TLS. It's easier than you may think. A typical Greylog deployment looks something like this, where you have your clients and your web browsers, your, your users, uh, log into Greylog server over through HTTP. Then you have <clears throat> log sources that are sending logs through protocol, through, through TCP, UDP, and GELF. Then you have the connection between Greylog uh, web server and the open search backend. You also have open search connections between other open search nodes. And as you can see there, it's all within a separate little network there. All these communications can be encrypted and authenticated. By default, they are not. They are completely open and clear text. Why do you want to encrypt? You think, okay, we well, want a trusted network. We have all our, our security controls in place. Everything should be fine. We're, we use a VPN or we have strict policies. And you may think that TLS is, is, is too complicated. I can, I can attest as a support engineer that we do get a lot of tickets on uh, certificates. I will walk you through that. So you will be experts too. But there's three main reasons why you need to encrypt. One, privacy. If everything is clear text, it can be read by, by anyone listening. Trust, you need to be able to trust all the nodes in your deployment, in gray log, open search, log sources, and then authentication, because even if you do have encryption and, and trust, you need to, you only want certain devices and certain users to be able to access that data. For privacy, the problem is clear text, like I just said. User logins are completely clear. Incoming logs that can, may contain sensitive data are completely clear, and the connection to the open search backend is in the clear. So the solution, of course, is to encrypt. You can encrypt the web UI inputs and then your backend connection. Trust. There, there's no, by default, there's no mechanism to verify that the server you are connecting to is, in fact, the server you're intending to connect to. This includes server and application names, and it's, it's prone to man in the middle attacks or spoofing, and uh, self signed certs are just gross and should not be used in an enterprise deployment. So the solution, of course, is to make certs, but just like self-signed certs, you can't just make certs and call it a day. It needs to be within an organized and planned uh, public key infrastructure, PKI. You can encrypt the Greylog API, which is also the web interface, the open search API, and then with this, you have a fully trusted certificate chain using either your internal CA, which a lot of people do, or use something public. We have log sources that sending in are, are not authenticated. Any log source can send in to an open port. And so we definitely want to address that. Log data in the open source backend. Without user authentication, there's any user, including the gray log application itself, would be able to read sensitive data stored in open search. And so the solution here, not surprisingly, is more certificates. Inputs can use mutual TLS, which is basically cert certificates on TCP connections. And then there's open search includes an internal user database with the open search security plugin. This is what a certificate looks like. If you just plain text file, it looks very organized. I will personally ship this gray log t-shirt to anyone who can read this and tell me what the common name is. Without using OpenSSL, which is what we use to parse this, we feed that file through OpenSSL commands with a few other flags and it spits out the actual structured human readable data. A few key lines in here, and there's, there's a lot of information, but a few key lines are the and subject. The issuer <clears throat> is the certificate authority that signed this certificate. And in, in PKI, the, there's levels of, of trust. Server certificates are always signed by and verified by a certificate authority, which, as you can tell, an authority is the authoritative source of trust for that certificate. And the subject is the entire distinguished name, or, or DN, of the certificate itself. This one here in our example is a wildcard certificate, which you can tell by the asterisk in the common name that covers all subdomains under the logfather.org domain. But there are other fields you can have as well. There's organization, organizational unit, localities, but all those fields are not required. The only one that's um, required is the common name, or CN. The first page was just the top half because slides don't really go vertical. But the next part here has the extensions, which is, a, is an extension on the X509 protocol. But there's a few key things here. There's a key usage 
configuration where it's this key or this certificate can only be used for certain things. And in this case, we needed to say dig digital signature and key encipherment. There's several others. We won't get into those, though. Extended key usage is just more of the same, more of the things that need to say certain things. The CA flag needs to be false for all service certificates because they're not CAs. But, of course, for CA certificates, then CA would be set to true. Lastly, the subject alternative name. Now, this may actually be the most important field in the entire certificate because modern browsers, modern as in probably since 2015, I think, all require, they base the, the verification on what's in the subject alternative name or SAN and not the common name. Basically, the, the subject alternative name lists all DNS and or IP addresses that this certificate is supposed to represent. In our case, we just need it to represent asterisk.logfather.org. But of course, if you have a very tightly controlled IP, IP address layout, then you can put your IP addresses in there as well. All right, so enough talking. Let's go. What do we need? We need application host names or IP addresses. Like I just mentioned, before you deploy your PKI, you need to know all the host names that you're going to be using for communication between the nodes. And this includes application names. So sometimes you can have a certificate that represents just the word gray log. And as long as that's the word you put in the browser or the, whatever connection string you're using, that's what the certificate will represent and only what it will represent. In order to use host names for this, you need to have um, well-tuned DNS resolution. Your clients that type in graylog.company.com their DNS server needs to point to your, your Graylog server that is presenting the graylog.company.com certificate. If, if it goes to somewhere else, then whatever's on the other side is not, it, there could be a name mismatch and it, it would not work. You need certificates with SANS. The SAN is the definitely required in modern browsers. The CA certs need to be installed on all your clients. If you have an internal CA, yeah, Let's Encrypt and CA is by default trusted by pretty much every browser. But if you have an internal company CA, then the certificate of that CA needs to be installed on all clients so that those clients know to trust your CA. A super nerdy Hitchhiker's Guide reference that I won't embarrass myself by going through. So let's start. Securing the Graylog web interface. Step one, instill fear by demoing the dangers of clear text connections. Okay? You do not want it. There's, if you're watching this, you probably know this already, but we will show you exactly why clear text connections are no good. And then to remedy this, we will configure Graylog with certificates and keys, and then configure the Graylog internal Java key store. And I have a super slick demo here for you to watch, and I'll just walk you through it here. First, I'm going to start with a TCP dump on port 9000. This is by default Graylog out of the box, no encryption, port 9000 being the web port. And we're going to watch what comes over the wire when I perform a login on the web interface. Admin, this is a super duper secret secure password. And so I'm logging in and we will see well, the login. And then what do we see here? Username, admin, password, yabba dabba do. So it's completely clear text. <clears throat> this is exactly what goes across the wire. So obviously this, is, this needs to be fixed. Let's configure the Java key store now, so that way we have a place to install our certificates. Every Java-based application uses a Java key store. Here is the certificate chain. This is basically the server certificate and the <clears throat> CA certificate, and we're going to munge them together. Here we're opening up the Java key store. We encrypted the private keys, so that way it's, it's actually as a as password uh, protected private key. Just one extra step never hurts. The key tool command is what we use to interface with a key store. And by default, your shell doesn't know where it exists. And with Graylog 5.0, we bundle all the Java binaries with it. So we have to go tell your shell, hey, go to the Graylog bundled version of the key tool command. We can just type key tool without specifying that entire path. There you see the path works now. And so here we're going to add the certificate to the key store. So 
So here is the entry in the key store, and we're going through just verifying that this is the right certificate, all the different parameters that we need. The subject alternative name, <clears throat> the alias is completely arbitrary, but it's, it doesn't have to match anything. Uh, but of course, it's just best so you, so you know what entry it is. So we said, yes, we're going to trust this crazy certificate and we're going to double check. This is the actual entry that shows up. So this is why aliases are important. This is how you're going to be able to tell what file it is. The certificate is now in the Java key store, which Grail uses to, as, its, as its internal database of trust. So now we need to add a few lines to a few configuration files. The top one here is our graylogserver.conf. I'm changing the bind address to port 443. Uh, which is, is optional, by the way. You can leave it at 9,000, but I just don't like putting port numbers in uh, URLs. So, change, and by extension, we need to change the publish URI, which if you didn't change the port, you need to add it here. The publish URI is important because this is what your certificate needs to represent. Notice here, William Trelawney hyphen lab dot glogfather dot org matches the wildcard pattern. So the certificate will work with this if when I put this into my, my browser. Enable TLS true, TLS cert file and key file are just the paths to the files and then the password if you specified one for the private key, which I don't know if specifying a password of test is actually doing anyone any good, but this is a POC. And then the Graylog server Java options, we just need to modify this because by default our key store didn't exist before. So we have to tell Graylog where to go to find the key store. We have the path there. If you change the bind address port to something to a privileged port under 1024 then you need to give the Greylog server service a certain capability to bind to that kind of port so that's what the bottom part is let's demo a an encrypted login and see what we see so we're going to do a tcp dump on port 443 and we're going to grab for password because that's what we know shows up when you log in you see there the url is https and there is a fancy lock pad. But now you see we don't see anything. <clears throat> Why is this? So we grepped for passwords. So let's take off the password part and see what shows up. I'm going to do another login. Oh, this is a bunch of encrypted garbage. Of course, that was before the login. So we're going to do another login now. That's what happens when you're sniffing an encrypted login. Next part, we need to secure the gray log inputs. Another demo of incoming logs in clear text, which is going to be really bad. Configure inputs for encryption, because you have to tell them where to get the certificates, just like we did for the web server. And then we're going to do a little demo on why encryption alone is not enough. And, how to, and then how to remedy that. Here we're going to do another TCP dump on port 12201, uh, which is the GELF port. Uh, GELF is really cool, by the way. You should be using it. The gray log extended log format. It's got everything you need. And here we're going to send in a test log through curl um, on the same host. So, so it, sh it shows up here on the, in the web UI. But we're going to see here that, oh, yes, you see the, there we go, that, and that's Gelf right there. Version, host, and short name. See, real simple. You should all abandon this log now. <laughs> Encrypted log, you can see everything. So imagine what could be in that log file that would be nasty for people to, to sniff. So then we go into the input and we specify the path to the certificate, the key, enable TLS, and the password. Now let's see what it looks that same message looks like through an, an encrypted input. We do another TCP dump, <clears throat> same port because we didn't change the port number. So we're going to send in another log. This time, of course, changing the input to, to specify HTTPS because Gelf is HTTP. It looks like it. I don't know. It's JSON. It's good. You should use it. So here, all you can see is the, the William Trelawney lab org, and that's for the MTLS. That's just to clarify. That's the only thing that comes across, right? The host name of the Greylog server that you're sending the log to. As you can see, the rest of it is more garbage. But encryption alone, enough, right? Even if a, a, a stream of data is encrypted, we still face an issue with now anything and everything in the entire internet can be sending encrypted data on this port and our gray log, our, our poor gray log will be ingesting it. All those super efficient extractors and pipelines that you've written will love you. So we're going to do another TCP dump. Oh, 
One more again. Here we go. There we go. <clears throat> and so this actually is my actual laptop. It's not the lab environment that the last log went through. As you can see by the super authoritative name, willslaptop.home. So I'm going to send a log to the actual, over the internet, to my lab instance. And you see it shows up right there. So if this were a live demo, which I was going to do, you all could have sent logs to this instance and totally demolished the entire presentation. But it would have been a good demonstration of why authentication is just as important as encryption. So you see the, the log is encrypted there, same thing, but again, it's from a completely untrusted, unsolicited log source. The special thing about inputs that I don't feel like a lot of people know about, um, based on my customer interactions, so this, is, this hasn't really come up too much. Uh, you can use certificates to authenticate log sources. And it's just another uh, configuration option there below the other ones we had. And you specify a certificate chain that goes up to the mutual CA that your gray log and your log sources can both trace their chain of trust back to. So if you have an internal CA that signs your gray log web server cert, as well as all your firewall, log, firewall devices and all that, they share the same CA root, then only log sources <clears throat> that are signed by that CA can send logs to your input. Let's, of course, try another one. So this time we're going to tail the server.log because there's going to be some special output we see there. So we're going to do the same thing for my, my personal laptop. We're going to send another Gelf log over via curl. Curl's going to hang for a bit, and we're going to see that it spits out some SSL error. Uh, it's very cryptic, as all OpenSSL errors are. But basically, it's saying it failed, and you don't see the log there in gray log. And the server.log, but an associated SSL error, basically saying that the client did not present a certificate. So it dropped the log. So, so now we've prevented, yeah, now we've prevented some random log source from connecting in. So the final leg of securing Graylog is, of course, securing the OpenSearch backend. And OpenSearch conveniently ships for free with the OpenSearch uh, security plugin, which we will heavily utilize for this. So first, to demo why we need to encrypt, which, as you can see, if you're still asking, but you're in the wrong place. You haven't been paying attention. And then, so we, then we do the OpenSearch configuration tell OpenSearch to use the security plugin and then configure the security plugin with encryption and authentication. We are going to start with a TCP dump on port 9200, which is going to catch traffic from Graylog to OpenSearch. Then we're going to send some log data in. <clears throat> this is a log that contains credit card information. That's my actual credit card, so feel free. Buy some Greylog swag. Credit limit of $5, though, so I don't know how much you're going to get. And so you see the log comes in. <clears throat> and the log makes it in. And so we see the log in clear text being sent to open, the OpenSearch backend. And so any, anyone on your internal network, we saw a previous presentation about people focusing on perimeter security but neglecting in internal security. So if someone makes it through your breach or is an internal actor, they could be sniffing this traffic just as easily. And even though your log came into Graylog encrypted, it is, at this point, written to OpenSearch unencrypted. <clears throat> so, of course, this is a major security hole. So first we're going to enable the OpenSearch plugin, um, setting plugins.security disabled to false. So the, the double negative there pretty much means that it's, it is enabled. Uh, both the HTTP and the um, transport layer to use our open search certificates. The separated out because the HTTP refers to clients connecting into open search, such as Graylog. And then the transport section is for open search nodes talking to each other because we definitely do want that to be encrypted as well. Then finally at the bottom we have the admin, the open search admin certificate. Now, the CN here is largely irrelevant because it doesn't have to map to actual username. But this is just basically open, this is you telling OpenSearch that any client presenting this certificate it can do admin things, user authentication. 
And so there's basically four steps to configuring the open source plug, four big steps, because the plugin is very big and there's lots of intricacies that I'm not going to cover on the presentation. First step is to generate a password hash using the convenient hash.sh script that ships with open search, the security plugin. <clears throat> Delete all the demo configuration inserts and open search will actually complain if you have demo certificates still present. Add the OS admin to user database when you give the admin, you give the user the admin role and then we run the initialization script and punch it Chewy into hyperspace. Okay, so here we go. We're going to initialize the open source security plugin. This is the, the security admin.sh script that ships with, all, all this stuff ships with open search security plugin. So as you see, we have a lot of options here. Uh, we need to run the command as the open source user. So that's why the, the sudo dash u. And um, <clears throat> We're setting the open source Java home path because your shell most likely doesn't know where the open source Java binaries are. So we can set that in line as an environment var variable there. The way um, we don't need that environment va variable to be set outside of this. The full path to securityadmin.sh. This CN stands for cluster name, which is conveniently confusing for talking about common names and certificates, but two different con two different things. And then the cluster name has to match what is set in opensearch.yaml as your, I think it's cluster.name in there as well. Path to your CA cert, which is a, a CA cert chain, basically is the, the chain of trust up to your CA. Server certificate, key of course, key password. CD is the configuration directory with all the security plugin uh, files. And lastly, H is the host name of the OpenSearch server that you're securing. So let's see it all in action. <clears throat> so this is me going through the open search security uh, configuration, the, the hash.sh. Basically, I'm just going to go through all the steps I just outlined. So we copy the hash that comes out. We, we set a super high security uh, million character password there. And now we're going to configure open search. The, uh, in the tenants file, we need to delete the, the demo tenant. We don't need the tenant because Greylog is our tenant in this in this case. And all the demo users in the internal users database, which is just a YAML file. Here we have the hash password and the admin role set to the, the admin user. And now we're going to run the security admin.sh script, tie it all together. And all the options I, I laid out in the previous slide are here. I'm just going to highlight them again, past self. Yeah, sure. The, the key, the key password, host name. <clears throat> and we're going to watch the magic happen. All those success messages. And, uh, yep. There we go. Basically saying that, yes, this, is, this has worked. It's a lot of output for a successful, but I guess that's a, a good thing so you can watch what happens. And now, so we've set up OpenSearch to use the security plugin, and we've configured the security plugin. Now we need to update Greylog, because Greylog has been sitting there. And if, you're, if you've been watching your server.log at this point, you're going to see a bunch of messages about, uh, they say something else, some other, I forget what it says, it's some uh, cryptic OpenSSL error. But basically, it's Greylog saying that it's not able to connect to OpenSearch, because OpenSearch is expecting HTTPS and it's still talking HTTP. Go back into Greylog, change Elasticsearch hosts to the, the, the URL, including user authentication that Greylog is going to use to connect to OpenSearch. We, we restart Greylog server to make those changes go into effect. We look in the server log for the, for the line saying it's successfully connected to OpenSearch because if you've worked with OpenSSL before and, and TLS certs, then you know that something always goes wrong. Do, getting, to the, getting to this point took me more tries than I care to admit. So always verifying that Greylog is, is happy with everything is always good. So here, do a TCP dump and capture a, an, an encrypted log being sent to OpenSearch. So no, do another TCP dump on port 9200. Port, port numbers don't change. And I'm, yeah, I'm going to use a curl command, but also supply the, the certificate 
so that the curl client is actually supplying the certificate because that's, we, that's part of the configuration we did earlier. So we see the log came in, and now we see we don't see anything because of the grep, of course. We're grepping for a string that grep doesn't see because it's encrypted. So we're going to take off the grep and just see what all comes in. Now, I'm constantly sending in logs, so there's going to be a... And plus, this is also just gray log just checking in with open search all the time because they're really chatty. But yeah, there's a lot to keep up with, so it makes sense. And yeah, so there, there's the encrypted log coming in. This is the last step in encryption. So now all communications, logs, users coming into gray log, logs coming into gray log, and gray log talking to its open search backend are all encrypted, authenticated, and super duper secure. Do we have any questions? I know that was a lot. And if you have any hard questions, feel free to send it to our ProServe team. I heard they deal with everything that <laughs> we can't deal with live. I, I have uh, two general comments that I didn't get covered. OK. Uh, my, <clears throat> my, my dear coworker, Ed, has a question. He's going to grill me. Go, go. Yeah. The, the mic is it's on okay. his face. Yeah. It's okay. Am I supposed to hug you? How does this work? You can. So I didn't see this covered, Yeah. but whenever you're doing the import mm -hmm. of the cert, don't use the store pass uh, switch because what can happen is, uh, a lot of people don't realize this, the default password, it's changing. And so all of this hard work that he's done, if you don't change that password, it's going to be in the history. No, that, that is a good point. And that's something that I did forgot. To, I did it in the demo. And you, if you were following along, you probably saw that I changed the default password. I forgot to say it. So good call, though, for sure. That, yeah, definitely good call. The question I had was, so you did about 30, 35 minutes here, 40 minutes even, and you went through a ton of information. In actuality, the, the part where you're actually doing the real configuration, what would you estimate that would have been? Basically, what's the length of your demos, would you say? Oh, to do all the commands, about five or ten minutes, maybe, max. And again, of course, a lot of Five or ten minutes up. max is awesome. That was my question, mm -hmm. and now I'm saying it, at the end of it, you just did a great presentation where you talked about encrypting at basically the database layer mm -hmm. in transit and in flight from the collector, mm -hmm. as well as front to back from the UI mm -hmm. in five to ten minutes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to just do that. That's why right. the... I yeah, appreciate it. Yeah. That's why the, the real subtitle was like, it's easier than you think. There's a lot that goes into the planning, and there's a lot can go wrong. But overall, yes, it's just a, it really is just a few commands. Thanks again for showing up. Let me turn to the thank you slide. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good one, folks.